Welcome everybody. It is the two minute drill training. That's right. The perfect pitch training. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We do this every Friday for over 20 years. Free training. We will have Q&A uh, after the first 30 minutes or so of training the perfect pitch. Uh, if you have not checked out two minute drill at launch today on Amazon Prime Video and tonight on Bloomberg Television. So check it out. You'll love it. You will learn more about the perfect pitch. If you want the perfect pitch document, uh, it's free with my book, uh, ebook, audiobook. I'll sign a book, send it to you, and ship it. Perfect pitch document, David at dmelzer.com. So we have two asks for everyone today. That is to watch Two Minute Drill, learn and love it, and then to the perfect pitch doc with my book, David at dmelzer.com. Well, let's talk about the perfect pitch. Um, I take my pitching seriously in respect that I think it goes beyond understanding uh, what to have in a pitch. It's why are we pitching? And there's three reasons to pitch. Uh, the first reason is to stimulate interest. The second is to transition that interest. And the third is to share a vision. Whether it's broccoli to billions that you're pitching, it doesn't matter. You need to stimulate the interest. And so I think it's really important to understand we have to learn, be more interested than interesting, what people are listening for, you know, not what we want to pitch, but what are people listening for? Uh, and in that aspect, I think a lot of times we limit ourselves because we want to find the right person to listen to us when we're pitching instead of understanding what people are listening for. And when we change and shift the paradigm by finding people that are more interested than interesting like ourselves, find people with open minds, open hearts and open hands that we can be far more statistically successful. See, there's two ways uh, that we can increase exponentially the successful, successful pitch. And that's one, addressing or making aware of our pitch more people. So if more people are aware of our pitch, that's one way. And then the second way is to get them to be stimulated by our pitch, transitioning that interest into a chair, shared vision. Uh, so those are the mathematical ways that pitching is so important. And a lot of times we forget that aspect of wondering what people are listening for. Instead, we're too uh, self-centered and self uh, motivated to find the lowest hanging fruit to see who would listen to us. That's the perfect person. They're perfect color, they're perfect height, they're perfect weight, they're perfect religion, they're perfect uh, in their economic, socioeconomic background, they're perfect to pitch to. No. What are people listening for? And we want to find open minds, open hearts, and open hands, especially because how uh, connected people are. So in that respect, as we want to reach more people and get more people to call us back or transition their interest to a shared vision, we have the first component of a perfect pitch. And it's the most important component of pitching, the one that's overlooked the most, and it's just plain credibility. If you are not practicing, I had uh, one of the winners from last season, season one of Two Minute Drill, come on Clubhouse this morning, and she talked about uh, practicing 400 times. 400 times that I talked about another TV personality that came on so confident uh, and completely choked the pitch, even though they're on TV every day as a TV personality. But yet this housewife, this mom, stay-at-home mom, outpitched everybody and won the episode because she practiced 400 times. And during that practice, she followed the perfect pitch document that uh, I had posted and utilized that in order to effectuate this perfect pitch. And she did it because she went through with a fine tooth comb, the credibility of what she was talking about and who she was as the jockey on this horse. Because we know for what she was pitching that it was going to change, grow, accelerate like all startups do. And that we need the right jockey to ride that horse, to train it, to grow it, to increase its speed, to increase its winnings. We need the right jockey to ride it. And through that practice, she looked through a fine tooth comb of the credibility. And so many people ruin a good pitch uh, because they're not credible. What do we do in credibility? Well, one, the obvious is some people straight out lie. Some people oversell, back end sell, manipulate, 
They cheat. And any time that we have even a feeling or a red flag of overselling, backend selling, lying, manipulating, cheating, street hustling, uh, you lose all credibility. And now, even if it's unintentional, we start looking for what else you're lying about, cheating, manipulating, overselling, a backend selling about. And it creates void shortages and obstacles. People determine your credibility and then they're listening for either more great value that you provide, more great truths that you're talking about, instead of looking for more lies, more shortages, more voids, more resistance, more reasons not to do your broccoli to billions, depending on what you're pitching. And so you need to practice through a fine tooth vision, fine tooth comb, the credibility of what you're talking about. And sometimes, like I said, we do it unintentionally. I use as an example, uh, my favorite one is I had someone pitch me and talk about how in the past year, they've increased their revenue 300%. Now, how does that sound to you? Most people have questions when you say that. And what's the first question you're thinking of when I tell you my revenue went up 300%? What was your revenue? Right? The first question that you're thinking about is, hey, that's terrific if you made a million dollars last year and it went up 300% to 300 million. I'm all in. But if you made three cents last year and it went up to you know, 900 cents or $9, I don't care. And those questions are the ones that either gain or lose the credibility that you need. And why is credibility so important? Because if you can reach, which is impossible, 100% credibility, everybody will do what you ask. Broccoli to billions, they'll give it to you. They'll eat their broccoli, they'll give you billions if you're 100% credible. If I was 100% credible, which I'm not, I can tell everyone here, the thousands of people that are registered on the webinar, the IG Live people, and of course the Clubhouse people, I could ask them to send me a million dollars and I guarantee that on Monday I'll send them back two million dollars and everybody would do it if I was 100% credible. They would borrow, beg, steal to find the million dollars even if they didn't have it because I'm 100% credible. It's the best guarantee of success you could have. But everyone has diminished capacity and some sort of uh, void shortage or obstacle from that 100% credibility. But if we practice and we utilize with a fine tooth examining comb that credibility, we will have greater statistical success. The number one thing is credibility. And that credibility is used to transition the interest. The math is used to transition, and I'll get to that. Now, the next thing, number two in the perfect pitch, is the emotional aspect, the emotional attachment. Remember, people buy on emotion for logical reasons. Uh, I did this with my first exotic car that I bought when I was in my 20s. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, what an idiot. Why did he buy that car? And of course, uh, I was emotionally attached to that car, but I justified it. Oh, it was a good investment. I bought it. Well, meanwhile, it was a horrible investment. The more I drove it, the more it broke down. The less I drove it, the more it broke down. And when it broke down, it was 10 times as expensive to fix. I thought that everybody would be impressed by my exotic car, and instead they thought I was an idiot or an a-hole. And I thought I would get all kinds of uh, dates from my car, but instead I think I just revealed my true anatomy uh, and my insecurities projecting on to what I needed to buy to impress people I didn't even like. Uh, so emotional attachment, though, people buy on emotion for logical reasons. We find emotional attachment in two different ways. One by finding out what people like about what we're doing today in the area, industry, career, job that we are addressing, or two, what they don't like. Both are equally as powerful in a pitch. But you cannot not know what they like or dislike, or you're stuck in a zone of indifference, of apathy, of non-stimuli. In order to stimulate interest, you need to have an emotional attachment of finding out what people like about what you're doing or don't like about what they're doing and seeing how you can be of service and value to enhance what they like or help with what they don't like to make it better. And this is where value is fine. This is the logical reasons that are fine. But you must understand emotion. I have a template that I use to find emotional attachment. And the first one is to ask, you know, if I'm in the cereal business, I would say, do you eat cereal? And if they say yes, I'd say, oh, which ones do you like? Why do you like it? What do you like about it? Which ones don't you like? What don't you like about it? 
Would it help you if I had a way to take off the sugar or put on the chocolate or put into the strawberries or whatever it is you like or don't like about it? I am now creating an emotional attachment by knowing what they like and what they don't like about cereal. And if even they say, I don't eat cereal, you then have a purpose opportunity to see, oh, why not? Oh, what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? Oh, I love the way it tastes, but I hate the sugar. Oh, did you know that you could have a protein-based cereal that has no sugar in it and you could have the exact same taste? Would that be of help to you? See, I'm creating an emotional attachment, and then I can circle back after I'm credible of being the distributor of cereal or marketer of cereal or someone who's worked in the protein space forever, whatever it would be that I described or discussed in the earlier part of the conversation or pitch from broccoli to billions. Need both credibility and emotional attachment. Those are the two most powerful things. So if you only have 30 seconds to pitch, work on the credibility and emotional attachment. That's it. If you have a minute, Work on the credibility, emotional attachment, and then the third step, in a minute or more pitch, at least quantify or articulate the quantitative value of what you are proposing or pitching to be greater than what you're asking for. Understand the reasons, number one, the reasons why that quantitative value is greater than what you're asking for. List them out. Put them together, add them up. Because if you can articulate a quantitative value greater than what you're asking for, you will have a statistical success almost compared to being 100% credible, almost compared to being completely aligned with an emotional attachment, supplementary and synergistic to what you're doing. It is so incredible. Why? I call it the 120 rule, right? I would stand up if I was here in person like I used to in training and say, who here has $20? And my friend over here would raise his hand, and then would say, will you trade me $100 for 20 And if I'm credible, meaning that they check out that I do have the $100 bill, and they do the little test to make sure it's real, almost 100% of the people would make the trade. In fact, a lot of people would be surprised uh, when I make that trade. 120 rule is the core basis of the articulation of the quantitative value. Use that as a litmus test. Am I well enough rehearsed, practice, and understand my business well enough to quantify and articulate the quantification of what I'm offering to be greater than what I'm asking for? And utilizing these reasons, these math reasons, are the third component of a perfect pitch. The fourth component, beyond credibility, emotional attachment, and articulating the quantitative value of the reasons that it's greater than what you're asking for, is impact. More than ever today, people will discount emotional attachment and the quantification of value or they'll add or appreciate, add value to the value of what you're offering according to the impact that it has. You actually now have a quantitative exponential factoring that occurs by illustrating impact. This will save lives. This will help our environment. This will give jobs to single moms. This will make this easier. Whatever it is, if you can illustrate an impact, it will add to the quantified value so that it enables you not only to add to the quantifiable value, but also to increase what? The emotional attachment. Because impact is a subjective matter of what's important to you, what you like or don't like, and if you're able to align the impact with that emotional attachment, you're just adding value in every way and maybe even your credibility. So impact is an enhancer. It's an accelerator. It allows to have exponential value to the credibility, emotional attachment, and the reasons and allows you to appreciate, add value to the actual articulation of the quantifiable value to be greater than what you're asking for. In other words, executing on the 120 rule. If anybody wants any information on the 120 rule, it will be sent with the perfect pitch doc in my book, ebook, audio book. I'll sign a book, send it to you in paper shipping. David at dmelter.com. The fifth step of a perfect pitch is what most people focus a pitch on. And the most people focus their pitch on the features and benefits or capabilities 
which lend themselves to discounting your credibility because you end up, if you're feature and benefiting dumping, if your capability dumping onto people, it tends to lessen your credibility because you tend to oversell, back and sell, lie, manipulate, or cheat. Sometimes without any intent at all, very often with little intent of doing so at all because you're in love with your own product and you haven't done the work. You haven't prepared enough to understand or articulate the quantitative value. You lose credibility. You don't explore the emotional attachment of what they like and don't like. You're incapable of articulating the 120 rule of the value being greater. You have not described effectively the impact. See, capabilities, features, and benefits are not the lead in the broccoli to billions pitch. What they are is an arsenal of value. They're an arsenal of value. You need to understand what features and benefits and capabilities are aligned with synergistic or supplementary to what you are spoken and have found the person that you're talking with and through. And the only way to do that is through this process of being more interested than interesting. And being able to look and see, what is this person that I'm pitching broccoli to billions to, what are they looking for? What are they listening for? Not listening to or being pitched at. I am pitching through you to understand credibility, emotional attachment, reasons, impacts, and those capabilities are the arsenal in which I use in order to effectuate an appreciative value so that I can articulate that appreciative quantitative value greater than what I'm asking for. The mathematical equation of a successful pitch. The broccoli to billions. And when I talk about broccoli to billions, I mean it is much harder to pitch a five or six year old to eat broccoli than it is a billionaire to ask him for billions. See, a billionaire who asks for a billion, he has no other emotional attachment than making more money with his billions. So to ask him for billions, and if you can quantify and articulate the quantification of the billions to make more billions, much easier pitch than getting a six-year-old to eat broccoli because it's so difficult to have credibility, emotional attachment, quantify reasons that are greater to a six-year-old. Because why? It's difficult to know what they're listening for to eat their broccoli. Comparatively, you know what a billionaire is li listening for. He didn't make that overnight. He didn't make that without understanding the value that you're articulating. So the perfect pitch doc that I'm going to send you at david at .com has credibility, emotional attachment, reasons, impacts, and capabilities. That's what it has. Now, you need to know the three purposes of a pitch. And the three purposes of the, a pitch we went over early. Now, how do we apply the perfect pitch doc to the three purposes of a pitch? The three purposes of a pitch, once again, are to stimulate interest, to get as many people as I can to be aware of through that stimuli and return more interest to me. Stimulate interest. I'm giving and creating an awareness of interest, but returning the interest to me. And then the second purpose is to transition that interest. And then the third of a pitch is to share a vision. Not all pitches have all three purposes in it, determinative upon where you are and how much time you have. You cannot stimulate interest, transition interest, and share a vision in a minute pitch. You can trans stimulate interest to learn more so you can transfer that interest and then share uh, that vision. But it would take longer than... 60 seconds. Some people can do it in two minutes at, on two minute drill. Uh, you can watch that tonight or today on Amazon Prime Video or Bloomberg. You can check it out. You'll see how some people can do all three and other people don't want. Other people just want to stimulate interest. So how do we stimulate interest the most? The most important thing in stimulating interest is the emotional attachment. People want to learn more for what they're listening for. I'll repeat that. People want to learn more about what they're listening for. And so if I'm going to do anything because I'm limited on the amount of time or access that I have, I am simply going to stick to the emotional attachment. And then when I get them to want to learn more, I will get more time, a different place, a different setting. I then can use my credibility and the math 
the credibility and the articulation of the quantifiable value to see what I'm asking for to transition that interest. And I can use documentation, I can use graphics, I can use all types of additional or supplementary information in order to transition that interest. But to share a vision, now we have to use the five items that I've talked about in the perfect pitch doc, which you can have david at themelter.com, which is when I share a vision, I have to establish close as I can 100% credibility, utilizing the emotional attachment that I utilize in order to stimulate that interest to continue that through the transition and share vision. I then have to continually appreciate the quantifiable value, meaning add value to the quantifiable value to exceed what I'm asking for by articulating the reasons using math, showing the impact, which is an appreciator and accelerator, allows exponential value to grow. And of course, using my arsenal, the bullets of features and benefits, not relying on featured benefits to oversell, back and sell, lie, manipulate, and cheat people. These three purposes, combined with the five criteria, the five perfect pitch items, understanding where we are in a setting of what people are listening for so they want to learn more, understanding how to stimulate interest, transition interest, and share a vision, you will increase that statistical success and efficiently, as well as be able to articulate the quantifiable value at all times to exceed what you're asking for. You will raise the awareness at a higher frequency so more people are listening for you and more people will respond to ask and learn more. Increasing the top of your funnel, which obviously, no matter what your skill set is, increases your statistical success of broccoli to billions. And better luck with the broccoli than the billions. Now, how do we do that? The number one thing that I see differentiating people on Two Minute Drill, and we're in season two, so there's about 72 people that make the, the final show. There's thousands of people who apply. By the way, we've been approved for three more seasons, so if you want to apply to win $50,000 of cash and prizes, which we give away every episode, plus a JA Junior Achievement Impact Award, plus the exposure of Bloomberg TV and Amazon, plus all the digital aspects and assets that we're given, if you want all that, you can go ahead and email me and apply for the next season. Uh, but in order, what I've seen out of all of these pitches that we have is the differentiator, the subtlety of success is practice. The Bonnie Hewitts of the world who wanted to do number one, my famous house mom who just blew everyone away practiced 400 times, videos herself, did it in front of her family, her friends, associates, and she came on like a movie star slash rock star and blew our doors back, hitting perfectly all the things in the perfect pitch document, understanding the purpose of her pitch with the two minutes that she had, ending on the perfect amount of time, utilizing the amount of time because she was so real with her, so practice. See, I use a litmus test called the clap test. And I derived this, I was speaking in front of 70,000 people, which is the biggest crowd I've ever spoken in front of live. And my uh, daughter asked, Dad, aren't you nervous? And I said, no. I said, why don't you come out on stage with me? No, I'm not going to go on stage. Why don't you just come out on stage and clap once and leave? Huh? Would you be nervous? Come out on stage, clap once and leave. No, I won't be nervous to clap once. I said, well, that's how I feel about my speech. Because I practice. I practice. Why do you think I do this every day? Why do you think I enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential? Because I'm practicing. I'm creating clarity, balance, and focus, which gives me greater confidence that clears the interference between me and the truth, allowing my frequency to be so high that I can reach the awareness of so many more people and have them learn more from me because I know what they're listening for. And I practice that so it comes as clearly and as easily as just clapping once. That's what you want to do. Have the clap lip this test. Practice, practice, practice. Number two, take advantage of the setting. You know, everybody was a little discouraged at first with COVID. Oh, how are we going to ever pitch from broccoli to billions on Zoom? From broccoli to billions on Zoom, it actually has so many other aspects of being able to put notes up, being able to use backdrops. Being able to use messaging, advertising, contact information, all of these different things. I can put David at dmelter.com behind me so you can get your perfect pitch docker, the purposes of a pitch docker, my book, ebook, audiobook, a sign book. I can put that all back here if I wanted to. 
I can make myself look younger, older, better, taller, smaller. All because I'm taking advantage of the setting that I'm in. Make sure you take advantage fully of the setting in person on the phone, via email, traditional media, or digital. Doesn't matter. Most importantly, you have to be more interested than interesting. Overall, the greatest lesson that I've learned is to be more interested than interesting. Uh, to find out what people are listening for so they will listen more. So that you can have full and take full advantage of the five pitch perfect doc of the stimulating of interest, transitioning interest and share vision of your ability to articulate the quantitative value of what you're asking for to, to what you are offering to exceed what you're asking for. It takes practice. It takes interest. Remember the mathematical equation of luck. What you pay attention to and what you give intention to will equal the coincidences that you want from broccoli to billions. From broccoli to billions, you need to be credible. You need to go through with a fine tooth comb to make sure you're not overselling, back end selling, lying, manipulating, and cheating. And one of the best ways to do that is to learn these three words. Three powerful words that never did I talk about early in my career. And they are, I don't know. I don't know instantly gives you credibility. Especially if you add to it, I don't know, but I can find out the answer for you. Man, talk about a jockey I want to bet on. When I get an entrepreneur who tells me, I don't know, but I can find the answer for you, your credibility quotient went up double. One of the best things that I like about my friend Gary Vaynerchuk when working with him and mentoring with him is that I love when he just says, I don't know anything about that. Right? I tell him the same thing about his NFTs. I don't know anything about it. Right? I can only know so much. There's billions of different things to know about. I only know what I know and I try to know it better than anyone else by practicing, by literally being more interested and interesting about the skills and the quantum nature of my own being and the experience that I have. So be more interested than interesting. Remember everybody, if you want this perfect pitch doc about credibility, emotional attachment, articulating the quantitative value via the reasons, showing the impact to appreciate that value, to exponentially appreciate it, and use your features and benefits, the capabilities and arsenal to add even more value, david at dmelter.com. If you want the purposes of the pitch, how to stimulate interest, transition interest, and share a vision. Using emotional attachment to transition it, the likes and the don't likes, the math and the credibility to show the transition of that interest, and then all the five from the perfect pitch document, David at dmelcher.com, to prove it and share a vision. To practice, practice, practice using the clap litmus test. To take advantage of the setting that is provided in the time that is provided for you. And finally, being more interested than interesting, I promise you, from broccoli to billions, you will be a perfect pitcher. You'll be the Sandy Koufax, the David Wells, or whoever else, the Trevor Brower, whoever else you want to say, you will be the perfect pitcher. Remember, two-minute drill, great lessons, great judges, all different perspectives, all types and, and styles, but you will learn. It's on Amazon Prime Video and Bloomberg TV. It will also be replayed on the playbook as this training. So every Monday on Spotify, every platform, this is featured. The playbook's one of the top podcasts in the world now, thanks to you. Remember these guides, Perfect Pitch Doc, The Three Purposes Docs, my book, ebook, audiobook, I'll sign the book, send it to you, david at dmeltzer.com. All right, I'm going to take a quick uh, question online here in the webinar. And uh, Christina Madrigal, you'll be the first one up with your question. First question, what does turn your foes into Joes mean? Well, in pitching especially, uh, so many people have great fears. Fear of missing out, fear of what other people will think, fear of failure, the foes, I'm fear of and it's so easy to give meaning to what we see. And when I started realizing every time I feel the foes, I'm going to turn it into the Joes. So I have a terrible uh, thing. Me and my, my friend Rob Angel, uh, we're, we're the king of FOMO. 
fear of missing out, man. It almost exhausted us both to death. We had to be invited to everything, had to go to everything, couldn't miss out. When you're in running the most notable sports agency in the world or the global marketing company of sports, you're invited to a lot of stuff. And FOMO can exhaust you or even kill you. I made it the JOMO, joy of missing out. FOPO, fear of other people's opinion, became JOPO, the joy of other people's opinion. I will not allow my experience to be affected by someone else's offense. If that need is their own ego, that's their own interference, not mine. So turn your foes into Joes. The number one reason that people do not succeed in a pitch is they have foes. The fear of not succeeding, the fear of not funding, the fear of what other people will think or other people's opinion. Turn those into Joes by finding and indicating the lessons that you can learn, knowing that anything that you're afraid of is just pushing you to a better place, a better position. It's indicating you have lessons to learn. It's giving you excitement and adrenaline and a dose of dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins to make your life better, to make you happier. And as you know, my mission is to empower over a billion people to be happy. All right. Thank you for that great question. Next up is my friend, Christina Madrigal. Christina, you have a question for me? Hello and happy season two premiere day! Woo-woo! So excited for you guys. Oh my gosh, what amazing work y'all put into this. I'm super excited to see it. So congratulations. And um, this training has been amazing as always, so thank you. And uh, my question for you, uh, you've answered it for me many times. I just love to hear it and I would love to have the bigger audience here. You talked many times about you're looking for people with open hearts, open minds, and open hands. Can you please, in the context of pitch, explain what you mean by that? Thank you so much. Oh, great question. Thank you. Yeah, so the number one thing I look for when I'm pitching is an open mind. Uh, That's because if someone has a closed mind, it's very difficult, one, to have any credibility. It's also difficult to be able to articulate a quantification of value greater than what I'm asking for. Because skepticism and interference will always lead to what? Just wasting my time. That's why it takes a thousand times the effort, a thousand times the statistical success to get one person with an open mind to share your vision. A thousand times in an open mind. And so number one thing I'm looking for is that open mind. And then two, an open heart. Because I can get credibility with someone with an open mind, but if they don't have an open heart, they're not going to be able to emotionally attach. And so then I'm just strictly stuck with the percentage of credibility that I have with no connection. And without that connection, it, again, makes it very hard to stimulate interest and it makes it even harder to quantify and articulate the quantification of that value to be greater than what I'm asking for. An open mind, an open heart. And then finally, the pragmatic aspect of an open hands. So I can find someone with an open mind and an open heart, but if they don't have an open hands, if they have a fear, a scarce feeling of either helping you by eating broccoli or giving you billions or some spectrum in between your pitch, uh, they also, if they have closed hands, will not help you find somebody else. Right? Remember, one of the greatest aspects of where we live today is that most people have at least a thousand people in their network that they can with open hands reach out to. In other words, allow you to ask, hey, you may not be at the right place at the perfect time, but do you know any else that can help me? So you could take any power sponsor, someone that could help you and find others to help you and just take advantage of the thousand people that could help you. Increasing your statistical success, exponentially allowing you to reach more people with open mind, open hearts and open hands. And so more than anything, when I'm doing my due diligence of being more interested than interesting, trying to find the lowest hanging fruit, where I used to spend hours of research and time finding the exact avatar that I could find in the databases and the lists and the targets that were an exact avatar of what I thought would create the greatest statistical success for me. I was wasting my time because if they had a closed mind, a closed heart, or closed hands, it would take me a thousand times the effort to share a vision with them. But instead, the criteria of finding the lowest hanging fruit for me is people with open minds, open hearts, and open hands. 
And that's applicable to everything that we pitch from broccoli to billions. In fact, that's why the broccoli is so hard to pitch. It's very difficult uh, to have a six-year-old uh, have when it comes to eating vegetables an open mind. They may have an open heart because they love you. They may have open hands because it doesn't cost much or it doesn't take much to eat the broccoli, but they're their 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 uh, their their mind is closed to trying new foods. Uh, so go ahead. Let's all figure out the lowest hanging fruit includes those three criteria. Increase your statistical success by a thousand, and uh, you will have what you're looking for. All right. I'll take another question online, and I have a great guest up next. The host of the biggest show on Clubhouse. That's right. The Breakfast of Champion Champion himself. Glenn Lundy. Let me take this question and I'll get right to you. Glenn, thank you, by the way, for joining us. He'll also, Glenn, be on my other show, which we're filming in July, Office Hours, uh, with some other great people like Cameron Diaz and uh, Arthur Blank and Tillman Fertitta and Danica Patrick and uh, Maria Sharapova. Just the list will go on and on. Deepak Chopra, Sadhguru. The uh, list goes on and on. So Glenn Lundy is playing big on Office Hours this fall. We'll be filming it in July. All right, here's an interesting question. Why do you say that grace is an interval? Uh, grace itself, the ability to live in grace, uh, is an interval between your perspective and the truth. It's the vehicle that allows us to perform and execute on the truth. Uh, it's an interval or an intermission between the truth and where we live today. You utilize grace in order to get to the truth, to expand and accelerate our own meaning to what we see. Grace allows us, instead of looking out into judgment and conditions, grace allows us, instead of having foes, to have Joes. Grace is the interval between our pragmatic illusions that create interference and the truth. Grace is the interval that encompasses forgiveness and accountability to allow us to be thankful for everything. Grace allows pain to be an indicator, not a stop sign. Grace allows us to grow. Grace allows us to be happy in what others would seem or look at as miserable times. I have so many people, including my children, that I always say, that sounds like a first world problem. Grace is the interval between the first world problem and the third world problem. Grace is the interval in the clearer or the cleanser of interference that we create between what we are, our true self, happy, healthy, worthy, wealthy, and what we want to become. And grace allows us to take that interval to clear the interference so that we can enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of our potential, our truth. Grace is the interval between the illusions that we create, the interference that we create, and the truth. Use grace as a catalyst, as a superpower, as a cleanser, and you will have a smaller interval between the disturbance and interferences that we create for ourselves. In other words, it will only allow us to spend minutes and moments in the ego-based consciousness or interference. Grace will clear that and allow us to find and pursue our truth. All right, it is my honor and pleasure to bring my dear friend and someone that I mentor uh, and I'm so proud of the great host of the Breakfast of Champions here on Clubhouse, the biggest show on Clubhouse every day for five or six hours. Glenn Lundy leading the way. Welcome to the Clubhouse, Glenn Lundy. Meltzer, my man, dude, I'm super excited about the launch of your show today. I watched season one, watched those ones, so I'm excited to see all the enhancements. I know you made changes. And like, just super stoked, bro. I'm so proud of you. You're doing so many amazing things to impact the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know, these changes are for me. We, because of COVID, got rushed into season one, and it was a pilot that turned into a true season. Uh, but 30 minutes doesn't do it, right? You can't have the vignettes. We didn't have time to create our own music. We didn't even have a voiceover guy. So it was more like a game show to win that 50,000. And I 
am not, my brand is not in, comfortable in that uh, position as a game show host. So now to take on the executive role of being able to provide knowledge and dummy tax and experience, not only from me, but from Kim Perrell and Jason Waller and Roy Kataya and a variety of other unbelievable great entrepreneurs. I'm talking about nine and 10 figure people that can take people to the next level. It's been incredible. Uh, so thank you so much for coming in, man. You had a question for me? Any more comments? Yeah, let me drop let me drop a question on you. So when it, when it comes to pitches, let's say that you're not really in a position where you need money, which obviously we always need more money, but you know what I mean. Like, yep. you don't need money, you need more awareness, right? More brand awareness. So how does the pitch shift? If what you're looking for is to partner or create alliances that can help get your brain more exposure versus going a pitch where we're looking for dollars or an investment. Right. And I think this is a process of categorization and people do that all the time when they talk about smart money and dumb money. And I get frustrated a lot of times with people that are like, oh, you know, uh, I either don't need an investment or I'm only going to take smart money. I'm only going to take strategic investment. I always say, what do you, you know, literally, you got to have categories of what you need and how you're going to get it. In other words, you have to have categories, practice well rehearsed categories of that pitch perfect doc, right? I need to have, in this case, in order to raise the awareness, elevate the brand, create more strategic audiences, cannibalize those audience, or have better distribution, I still need to be able to pitch with credibility, emotional attachment. I need to quantify the reasons and articulate that quantification of why I need that bigger audience and the impact it will have for them. Quantify it. So even though it's not money, there's other quantifiable things like the mutual benefit or sharing of communities, the relationship of the brand to one another, the enhancement and acceleration and exponential growth by bringing both parties together. It's just like if I was raising money, I would have what I call the pulse fund where I'll take anybody's money that has a pulse, but they will not have any type of input or uh, interest in my business. Then I'll have a strategic investor uh, offer or pitch for those that have a lot more to offer and they may receive some discount or some other sort of integration that is beneficial. But if I'm just looking for a strategic partner to enhance my brand, accelerate the distribution, to build my audience and community, then I build my pitch around the credibility of that, the emotional attachment of that. I quantify the reasons why that will be valuable, meaning in theory, if I, you do this for me, if you give me this $20 of value of community, I'm going to give you back $100 of value of what you want. So I need to be more interested than interesting. Ask them what they're doing today. Find out what they like about what they're doing, what they don't like. See what value you can provide by saying, would it help you if I gave you a full clubhouse day? Or would it help you if you, know, you came to my workshops uh, at my automobile business? Or would it help you if you were a guest or a host on my TV show, Two Minute Drill? Right? These are all things that are subjective in nature. They are not as clear cut in value as a $100 bill, but they could have exceptional value determined upon you being more interested than interesting, you utilizing the perfect pitch document from broccoli to community to billions. It doesn't matter what you're pitching. You still have to follow the five to thrive, the credibility, emotional attachment, reasons, impacts, capabilities, using all the features and benefits that you have in order to incorporate a bigger audience, understanding the purposes of stimulating, transitioning, and sharing a vision, which you do so well, because I will tell you this, and I hope you take it as a compliment, you are the closest thing in person that I know that enjoys the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential. That's why you, your show was called The Get Up and Grind, The Start Up and Grind. You are a grinder. We are not as talented as everyone else, but we do it every day, and the results have been exponential. And I am just so proud of you, Glenn Lundy, and I'm so appreciative of your question, comments, and your support. So thank you so much. Thank you, man. And that was freaking awesome right there. I love the energy. You got fired up. We had Dave all fired up. And dude, you're just, you're a master, man. You're an absolute master. That's so helpful. 
So thank you, sir. Excited to see you next month, and uh, obviously excited to continue to run with you here on the clubhouse. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, thank you for giving me that 6 a.m. Pacific time slot. So Breakfast of Champions every Friday, 6 a.m. Catch Glenn and I. We're bringing on some big champions. We have some fun people today. I've had Marshall Falk. We had Sharon Lecter. It goes off. Uh, if you haven't tried it, reach out to me, david at dmelcher.com. i got a bunch of invitations to get people to join us on the clubhouse. But best show on Clubhouse, Breakfast of Champions every day. Don't forget the 111 on the weekend, my birthday. 111, sign of the inspiration. 111, join us to get inspired on Sundays with Darian and the rest of the crew. All right, next up, Niku uh, is up next. Let me take a quick question online. I uh, love this question as well. Thoughts on a 30-day to get fit type of program? Let me just tell you the problem with the 30 days, right? The problem with the 30 days is one thing. They don't take into account the quantum nature that you have. So anybody that can tell you it takes 30 days to build this habit doesn't know who you are or what you're made of and what is coming through you. So for example, if you wanted to quit drinking and you have an inherited alcoholism as a disease within the context of your quantum nature, it's gonna take a lot more than 30 days to stop drinking. But here's the bigger problem with the 30 day program. What do you do on day 31? We're gonna live a lot longer than 30 days. I, I get 30 days, but what happens in day 31? You want to create a program that's consistent every day, persistent without quit, in the pursuit of your potential. Know that two minutes a day is worth more than two hours on a Saturday. And I promise you two minutes a day for the rest of your life is worth way more than two hours a day for 30 straight days. And I promise you that if you have the skills, the knowledge, and the desire to get fit, you don't have to limit yourself to 30 days. You don't have to create void shortages and obstacles and resistance by putting a limitation of a man-made construct of days on anything. So those 30-day programs, you need to look at yourself and say, can I do this the rest of my life? Because what am I going to do in day 31? And I'm planning on getting to day 31. I'm going to live a lot more than 30 straight days. If these are not utilized to get you started, get you up, get you back up, get you restarted, it is not going to inspire you and get you there. See, it will, through Foe or Joe, it will get you up, get you back up, get you started, get you back started to 30 days. But what are you going to do in day 31? Because you need inspiration. You need to live in spirit by enjoying the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of your potential. So those 30 days to get fit, praise when they're a good start, they're a good restart, they're a good up and a good re-up, but they ain't going to get you there. Find something that's going to take you from day 31 to the rest of your human existence by learning to enjoy and finding meaning in what you do and what you see and what you say and what you believe every single day without quit in the pursuit of what you want. Not what other people want, not what's missing and not what you don't want. Remember, we got five daily practices of knowing our what or who or how are now and applying our why. Speaking of applying our why, Niku, welcome. You are someone that definitely knows how to apply your why to the happiness and abundance of others. Hello, 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 David. Your passion is infectious. You have me ready to run through a wall, my friend. Yeah, right on. <laughs> So my question for you, and you could probably hear Kai in the background, I'm trying to learn now in my 30s how to still do the things I love to do, which is pour into others, serve others, create impact, you know, do teammate, keynote speeches, all of that, but I need to learn how to work smarter, not harder. In my 20s, I was able to grind and do the six, seven days a week, the 7 a.m. to the 10 p.m., but now, as a mother of three and a wife, I need to figure out a different way to be able to do that so that I can make my family the priority, pour into them first, and still be able to pour into myself in order to pour into others for my abundance. And I see you always working around the clock, doing your IG lives every single day, doing all these amazing things. And so my question for you is, what can I be doing now to work smarter, not harder, and make my family the priority and not just grind the way that I used to? Oh, what a great question. And so many of us face that challenge. And this is where my Defy Daily Practices have really assisted me uh, because it allows me every day to have a weighted balance. According to my own non-negotiables, that can change and grow and accelerate. And those five daily practices 
will not only allow you to prioritize, but be more efficient, effective, and statistically successful. It'll allow you to be more productive and more accessible, not just accessible to your family, friends, associates, etc., but also access what you want. And it also will remind you, recollect, and remember the power of grace, of gratitude, of finding the light, the love, and the lessons in everything you do. So number one, I want you in the morning to take inventory very quickly of what your values for the day are. Know your what. Personally, this is what I want. The God negotiable for me of what I want every day personally is a minimum of an hour a day on my health. Because I can't give what I don't have. If I don't take care of myself, I cannot take care of my spouse, my children, and my local community, my state, my country, or the world. I can't do it unless I'm taking that minimum of an hour a day on my health. Then, a minimum amount of time with my family every day. Like I said, two minutes a day is with more than two hours on a Saturday. I'll use my teenage daughters as an example because I actually do give my three teenage daughters a minimum of two minutes a day. I asked for five, they gave me two, fair enough. I get as much as I can. These are minimums, but I do it every single day. A weighted balance of personal values of what I want every day. And then finally, I take that last section of utilizing my what of what am I going to do to be productive, accessible, and gracious? What am I going to do? A minimum amount of time studying my calendar, activity I plan, activity I don't have planned, and even my sleep. As everybody knows, I start my tomorrow today at 9 p.m. by putting my mind, body, and soul in the position to plateau and grow tomorrow, not to start the day at the bottom of the hill, just to push a boulder up to the top of the hill and have it roll down every other day, feel stuck, feel non, uh, non-enlightened and, and non Uh, expansive. So know your what personally, experientially be very clear on how efficient you can be with experiences. So one of the things that I did is I look for four minutes in all my experiences. So if I have an experience that seems to be a daily experience, like brushing my teeth, flossing my teeth, taking a swap of uh, Listerine, I'll try to do that four minutes faster because I know that every four minutes that I can save is 28 minutes a week, which is two hours a month, which is 24 hours a year, which is three full days at Disneyland with my kids. All because I got more efficient at brushing my teeth. So I'm always in search of four minutes for those experiential values that I have. Then, of course, my giving values of what product uh, service solutions of giving I can give to my family, local community, state, uh, national, and and world. And then finally, receiving. What do I want to get out of today? And when I get that clarity of what I want, then I create the biggest efficiency in my life, like Niku, is I find instead of trying to do it myself, learn it myself, I got the great level of delegation called Know My Who. And I look and see who can help me do this and who I can help. Then I apply my why, and I know my why of what it is that attention and intention go into by the activity I get paid for, activity I don't get paid for, my sleep, paying attention to and giving attention to the coincidences I want, creating the efficiencies with, for example, the four minutes. But there's other things that I've learned. You know, I always tell and joke and tell people, look, you know, here's a reward for everyone for coming to training. I'm going to give you two weeks vacation. I'll pay for it myself with this piece of advice. Did you know that most people waste 80 hours a year looking for things? And the majority of the time is spent looking for your wallet and your phone. So if you wanted to have a takeaway that's pragmatic and helping the coup and the rest of you have enough time, let me give you two weeks at Disneyland, 40 hours a week, 80 hours in two weeks. Find a place consistently to put your phone in your keys. You'll save yourself 80 hours a year not looking for your phone or your keys. These are the type of things that we can do and then know your how. Then, once we know our what or who and our how, we can know our now. We apply what we know is important to us, a weighted balance today, maybe different tomorrow, but a weighted balance today that I'm more important than my kids today and my kids are more important than me tomorrow and my husband's more important than me the next day. It doesn't matter because once you know your what, your who, and your how, you can prioritize your now. And the difference between efficient, effective, and statistically successful people, passionate, purposeful, profitable people, is they get stuff done and 100% of the things you do now get done. So get it done. Do it now. Use Eisenhower's matrix of importance versus urgency in order to figure that out with the what, the who, the how, and the now. And then finally, as I always teach, apply that why, which you do so well. Just spend minutes and moments in the interference in the triggers of the ego that create the void shortages and obstacles and interference between you and what you already are. 
because I know you. You are happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. You just have to take a little bit of time to see when you're interfering with what you already are. You also are invincible. And uh, I appreciate that. Hopefully those five daily practices, I'll send them to everyone, david at dmeltzer.com, with the perfect pitch doc, with my book. It doesn't matter. In exchange, if you go watch Two Minute Drill and Enhance Your Life, I'd appreciate it on Bloomberg and Amazon. Niku, thank you so much for that amazing question. It helped me and others, I'm sure. David, you're amazing. Love you. Love you. Thank you for coming. All right. my right. I'll take a quick question online. And my last guest, Greg Sturm, you'll uh, finish up the group for all of us. Um, I'm going to uh, change this here. How do you close your pitch? All right. I love that question online. Real quick answer. How do you close your pitch? Considering the reasons, impacts, and capabilities that we discussed, can you see any reason why you won't want to move forward? Considering the articulation of the value that I just described, can you see any reason you won't want to move forward? Considering all the benefits of eating broccoli, can you see any reason why you won't want to move forward? Write that down. Can you see any reason you won't want to move forward? Considering the credibility, emotional attachment, reasons, impacts, and capabilities, can you see any reason you won't want to move forward? Ultimate close. If you need to add two words, just say, does that sound, or three words, does that sound fair? We can move forward in this trade. Does that sound fair? Everybody loves fair. Not the one with the pigs in the Ferris wheel. Everybody loves fair. Not just, but fair. We all have a sense of fairness within the context of our being. All right. Does anyone see any movie we shouldn't move forward to the last question? Greg, what do you got for me? Hey, dude, man. I appreciate being on stage here. Um, yeah, it's funny. I was actually talking to Nick Sando a couple of days ago, and we, uh, you came up in the conversation, so I know you'd be saying hey to you right now as well. Um, you've definitely helped me in the past several uh, several years uh, in a couple of turns in my professional career. Actually, I saw my pastors relate to some of the verbiage that reflects, you know, the principle of consistent, persistent pursuit. So, you know, every time I'm logging in my computer platform, you know, I have a moment in my head and think the why, you know, my why and my approach to what I'm about to engage in. But uh, with that said, just engaging with you lately, I noticed another phrase I was hoping you could dive into and explain a bit further and, and why it's so important to you. And, and that's uh, Ray Vitsa uh, Locator. Yes, yeah, so uh, I see a lot of signatures uh, in emails, especially. Number one, this, top 10, this, top 100, this, Ellis Island Medal of Honor, Sports Humanitarian of the Year. And, you know, I started looking at uh, things with the lens of humility, of knowing that I don't know what I don't know, knowing that I am only trying to be consistent and persistent in the pursuit of my potential. And I don't want judgments or conditions or things that would separate me from all that I'm connected to and through. And so I decided in my signature to put res ipsa loquitur. Res ipsa loquitur to me is a cornerstone of who I am because it says that which speaks for itself. And so when I sign my name, it's the most valuable thing that I have, my legacy, that I want to make sure that I'm living life to my potential. Not like I did in the past, where I created void shortages and obstacles and my name did not speak for itself because I felt as if the mistakes that I made and the lessons I learned, uh, learned were not me, but they were. And so every day I look at Recipes of Loquitur and I want that which speaks for itself. David Belzer, hopefully kind, forgiving, grateful, accountable, and inspired and human. May I forgive myself and others forgive me for all the mistakes that I made with the greatest intentions that I have. I am healthy, wealthy, worthy, and happy. Res ipsa loquitur. And that's where we're going to finish up this training, two-minute drill, res ipsa loquitur. Let it speak for itself. Check it out on Amazon Prime Video on Bloomberg. Next week, topics BYOQ. It'll be a full bring your own question session. We'll do just this on Clubhouse, the Breakfast of Champions at 6 a.m., on IG, on the webinar, 6 a.m. Pacific time. I'll be live from Charleston, South Carolina, making it happen, BYOQ. You bring the questions, I'll bring the answers. Remember, everyone, if you want the perfect pitch, Doc, the five daily practices, the purpose of a pitch, my book, ebook, audio book, if you want me to sign a book, send it to you. If you want to join Clubhouse to see Glenn and I and Niku and all our friends, David, at dmelzer, 
www.tubeminutedrill.com. I can't wait for you to see Two Minute Drill. Thank you so much. And remember, most importantly, be kind to your future self and do good deeds. See you later. Welcome to Audrey.